Um, my name is Sean Horn. I'm the host of The Frame on KPCC. Uh, I'm going to bring the talent in. We'll have about a 10-minute conversation amongst ourselves, then we'll take questions from you all. But thank you very much for your patience. Um, starting at the back row, Tim Roth. <laughs> Demian Bashir. <laughs> Channing Tatum. <laughs> Bruce Stern. Hello, Bruce. Michael Madsen. You're in the back row there. Front row, Kurt Russell. Jennifer Jason Lee. Quentin Tarantino. Samuel L. Jackson. And Walton Goggins. Yeah. yeah. I'm in you guys look very sharp. <laughs> I invited you guys to this <laughs> telethon <laughs> for a reason. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have your backs cover. Jerry, <laughs> where's Jerry Lewis? Kurt, to you and Jennifer sit the next to microphone each, each other at everything. Is that right? Yeah. Are you yeah. still changing? Yeah. 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 Mine works. Yeah. But, but, but we're, yeah. we're good. Um, Quentin. I'm going to start with Quentin. Quentin, thank you guys for coming and thank you for your patience. I'm gonna have you. I'm gonna ask a question about Ultra Panavision. Um, obviously, it's epic in scale in terms of what it gives you in the frame, but I want to talk about what it gives your actors in terms of intimacy, in terms of the close-ups, in terms of the relationship of one actor to the other, and what that means to you as a filmmaker to be able to shoot actors in 70 millimeter. Well, you, I mean, you, you've actually kind of answered uh, kind of your own <laughs> question a little bit. Uh, uh, no, because literally that is the, the, uh, one of the tricks that I thought about was uh, uh, the intimacy that it uh, um, uh, provides you, in, in, in particularly in close-ups. I mean, I've shot a lot of close-ups of this man <laughs> right here, but I've, I've never shot them as beautiful oh, as did I did in this movie. I mean, there is a... Yeah, but I think you find yourself taking backstrokes in his eyes. Oh, all right, I mean, it's just uh, uh, <laughs> so so awesome. Yeah, it's just the way it is, you know. But one of the things that uh, uh, I remember when I uh, um, did the film, when it got when it was reported that I was going to do it in this format, people were actually I speculating, and I guess I understand it. They were like, "Well, yeah, okay, that sounds all really great, but why would he do it for a thing that's just so set bound?" And you know, I think that's actually just kind of a. a um, um, uh, uh, not a very profound uh, thinking when it comes to uh, 65 millimeter, that it's basically just for shooting travel logs or mm -hmm. shooting mountain sceneries or, and uh, uh, nature and stuff. Uh, I actually felt that, especially in um, bringing it into Minnie's haberdashery, if the film isn't suspenseful, i.e. the pressure cooker situation of what's going on in the movie, if that's not part of it, if uh, the threat of violence and the, uh, the pressure cooker situation isn't, is, if the temperature isn't always getting upped a notch uh, every, every scene or so, then the movie's gonna be boring, it's not gonna work. And I actually felt that uh, the, the big format would one, it would put you in Minnie's haberdashery. You are in the, that place. You are amongst those characters. Uh, and I thought it would make it more intimate when I got in close with them. But the other thing that I thought would be very, very important is there's always two plays going on in this movie. Once you're in minis in particular, there's two plays going on at all times. There's the characters that are in the foreground of any given scene, and then there's the characters in the background. And you always have to be keeping track, especially in this scenario, of where everybody is. It's like they're, they're, they're pieces on a chessboard, and you always have to see it. And so maybe it might be uh, uh, Chris Mannix and uh, uh, General Smithers who are dealing. But you're also clocking uh, 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 Joe Gage at his table, and you're clocking John Ruth and Daisy at, uh, at the bar. And that, and that becomes important, unless I don't want it to be, unless I want to uh, uh, cut them out and not show it to you. But you, I think that helped uh, uh, ration up the tension as things went on. And for the actors themselves, I mean, the, one of the limitations about 70 typically is that the magazines are very short, a little wonky, but it means you have very short takes. But you were able to equip your cameras with a lot more film so you could shoot your actors for six and seven minutes at a time. Is that yeah, right? even longer than that. I mean, the, uh, 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 Panavision came up with um, uh, 2,000 foot uh, mags, all right, where we were able to like shoot it for 11 minutes at a time. 
uh, which, I mean, I can't even imagine doing this material if we had to break it up in four minute goes. Uh, uh, we, had, we, we had to do it like that. I mean, the only real big limitation that I had as far as uh, my shooting was uh, the Weinsteins were, 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 were very generous with me, so I didn't have to dole out the footage in a certain way. I mean, I, I wasn't completely cavalier about it, but, uh, uh, but I didn't really change my shooting style for it, and that, that wouldn't have been the idea, is to completely change my shooting style, so I shot the way I wanted to shoot. However, um, the only real disadvantage I felt at the time, but then I don't feel now, was uh, we weren't able to get a zoom lens. And I have really gotten used to using a zoom lens and the little zoom creep. I've really gotten used to that. But actually, that was also kind of a nice thing to not act to, uh, to be uh, forced to not use all the tools that you've gotten used to from time to time and be able to uh, work in a different way. I want to ask this question to Demi and Channing and Jennifer, whoever wants to answer it. You guys are all virgins to a Quentin set, <laughs> rookies, what do you want to call it, neophytes. When you're asking the other actors, <laughs> <Neophytes>. Neophytes. <laughs> amateurs, <Yeah>. <laughs> first time, Bottom loser, be bridge. beginners, Bottom I'll take of the totem pole. I'll take <laughs> practically interns, <laughs> water boys, describing Channing's acting career. They paid okay. me. Yeah. <laughs> All those are Ch actually, Channing's actually got factual up. for me. Okay, you get the drip. Here's my question. I'll let Channing answer this one. Oh, thanks. What do you What do you want to know from the other actors about what to expect, and what is the surprising What is surprising about being on a Quentin set that's different from other movie sets? Um, well, first off, this I mean, it, it is an actual alumni to I think be in a in a Quentin film, and and you really feel that all these guys have worked together a lot, and it is a unique experience to be in a Quentin movie, I can promise you. Uh, and, and you're really intimidated, but every single person was so, I mean, Sam, I did my first movie ever with Sam. And, uh, and to come full circle like this is, uh, is pretty extraordinary. I think on the first day, I must have looked so geeked out because the very first shot was this crazy, like oh, the 360, 360 one, yeah. like and I'm, I'm just like wide eyed and trying to figure out like not to screw up. <laughs> and uh, Tim goes, yep, yep. You're about to be in a Quentin Tarantino <laughs> shot. And I was like, shit, pull it together, Chan. Like, like I don't look so like scared. Uh, but it was amazing. I mean, every single person here is uh, people that I admire greatly, and it was a learning lesson every single moment. Can I, can I just add one thing to that that was funny? I told him on uh, when we were in rehearsal, I go, you do realize you get to shoot Coach Carter, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Holy shit, I get to shoot Coach Carter. <laughs> Wait, all those suicides. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got you back now, Sam. <laughs> all those suicides. <laughs> all but those push-ups. Channing, Channing hasn't seen the film yet, so you're kind of spoiling it there. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, his bad. I was there for some of it. Okay, okay. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I want to ask Jennifer and Kurt about, are you guys, and I said this when we came in, maybe your mics weren't on, do you guys always still sit side by side, and are, were you side by side throughout the show? I, meaning, when the cameras weren't on, did you try to actually chain yourselves to one another? This is probably the first time we've ever sat like this. This is very, very uncomfortable. uncomfortable. I was thinking that, yeah, you're on the wrong, you're on the wrong we're side. We're complaining about it. We're just, just well, you know what, started. we're starting to go with it, and I say, bullshit, let's change it. Right now. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, we'll give you two seconds. Uh, we're going to just All right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. Now, now it's okay. Yeah, yeah it feels All's good. Right All's right with the world. <laughs> yeah, that was weird. I almost felt like I was on a date or something. <laughs> This is much more right. Uh, uh, but Kurt, after your character is no longer among the living, is that still you uh, lying on the floor there? Yeah, you know, I'd spent uh, four and a half months um, chained <laughs> to Jennifer, and um, I, 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 it felt very strange, the concept of people starting to drop like flies, and the actors that had been there for us were, no, were not going to be there for them. It just felt really weird, mm -hmm. aside from the fact that mm -hmm. I had a, a, you know, a really good ticket, a front row seat to watch <laughs> all these guys and not have to worry about lines, and then I just listen to it and, and watch it be played out. Um, but I wanted to be there for her to do whatever she needed to do. Look, in the movie, I'm, I'm dead for whatever period of time it is. It's not three weeks, or however long it took us to do it. So for her, you know, uh, if she felt like she needed to paw John Ruth, it, 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 that's going to be different than a dummy. And I knew that by being there mm -hmm. and by continuing the, I don't know, the day-to-day -day that we all had talking to each other, and it just was something that had to happen. 
Until they sleep. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was, that was, yeah, that was, that was like, oh. Jennifer, why did you stop? Because uh, uh, John wrote the snoring. <laughs> <laughs> Dead guy snoring. But, <laughs> yeah. Can't deny it. but honestly, like, um, they had a dummy for him. It's It was 30 degrees in that room, you know? So they had a full dummy with a full face cast, beautiful, like you couldn't tell from far away. I mean, yeah, Walton has a lot of videos Walton with that dummy. <laughs> <laughs> no, he, I would, I, like, we, the video uh, sat in a chair in the in the makeup room, and oh. different people <laughs> would go up and just slap John. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd send him like, okay, here, <laughs> bam! <laughs> I've seen like that video. I might have a lot of pictures of doing well, that. I'm like, why do you want to say that? <laughs> but <laughs> now that you mention it, it's a private yeah. film. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, darling. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Okay, but footage can be found on the black web. <laughs> Uh, I've got a question for Sam. Other actors can jump in she if they want finished. to. Oh, no, I'm finished. sorry. I'm sorry. Keep going. I just no. I do want to say one thing, which is I I couldn't have done that scene without him there. And that's really was three weeks of like 16 hour days lying on a cold floor. But I needed him and he was so there for me and it was just like it really, really touched me because as much as Daisy wanted to kill him, you know, be careful what you wish for. And I would never have really truly experienced that had he not been there for me to paw and miss and feel the heat leaving his body. So that was, that's only Kurt. Yeah. Oh, that's Kurt. Oh. <laughs> we have something to announce. <laughs> <laughs> well played. Get a roll. Do it. Do it. <laughs> okay, now I'm coming to you, Sam. But other actors, uh, 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 I, you can you can answer this. Quentin's obviously very precise in his language, and when you make a Quentin movie, if people don't know, you say the lines that Quentin has written. Yeah. As an actor, when there's no room. Not him. Okay. <laughs> well, that's my question. <laughs> Every actor here's like, ah, uh, not this motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> so my yes. Yes. Come on, come on. Keep the myth alive. <laughs> Keep the myth alive. Yes, outside exactly of yourself. What writes. <laughs> Out, the other actors have, I mean, I guess this is a good point of debate. What does that give you as an actor when you're staying relatively close? Uh, I think other actors may be a little bit closer to what's written in terms of what it gives you as an actor. A lot of actors like to wing it, like to improvise. When you're staying close to the dialogue, what does that benefit you in terms of your performance? I mean, there's not a lot that you need to change. I mean, Quentin and I have conversations about what I, what I say. Um, and I don't just willy-nilly change things. If I want to say something else, I'll go to him and discuss it with him, and we'll talk about it. And he'll say, well, let me hear what I wrote, and I'll say what he wrote, and well, let me hear what you want to say, and I'll say what I want to say, which is very close to what he wrote. I just want to say it another way because I think it comes out of that character's mouth a different way. And he'll say, okay, or he'll say, no, I'll leave it the way I wrote it. And that's generally what happens. Um, the rest of these motherfuckers need to say what he said. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Why'd you point at me? Why, 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 you point specifically right We got on the same wavelength. And uh, generally, when I get it, it's exactly, <laughs> it's, it's exactly what it needs to be. Um, as characterization starts and as we're in rehearsal, there are times when I'll feel like I didn't, I didn't say enough or I didn't have enough to say. And I'll say to him, could you add something here so that I can answer that or clarify this? And Quentin will do that. Um, but by the time the rehearsal period is over and we get there and we're ready to do it, nothing changes except, I mean, the only, only big change we had from being around the studio table and in minis in the studio and being outdoors with the stagecoach was the cold. Mm -hmm. That was the one thing, that was the wild card that we didn't really know about. And all of a sudden it changed the urgency of everything we wanted to do, especially outdoors. It's like, okay, I want to get inside that stagecoach now because <laughs> I don't like the snow running down my neck. <laughs> Bruce, someone asked the same question to you about working with Quentin as an actor. You've worked with a lot of great directors over the course of your career. What is it special to you about working with Quentin and how does he affect you as an actor? Well, I, Scoot in a wee bit. I uh, in my uh, journey, I don't think I've ever said this before, but this is the first movie I've ever done 
where I felt privileged to lend a hand because that's what you do for him. He expects everybody, I don't know what percentage you'd say, but let's say casting is 20, 80% of a movie. And he expects the people that he brings to do what he hired them to do and not act and be somebody else. And I felt that he asked me to come along and uh, lend a hand. And so that's basically what it is. I mean, you've got, when you go to work for him, everybody on the set, and we're talking about everybody behind the camera, division by division by division, everybody knows you have a chance to go to the playoffs. But what you don't know is that what you're going to end up in this one, it's my first time in an opera because the guy made an opera. And just to be a part of that, not I couldn't sit through a fucking opera, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna turn it over to some audience questions, some press questions. We'll try to move it along. I'll go here and be sure to include our back row. We got a lot of people up here. So the shorter the better so we can get to as many as possible. Hang on one sec, we have Mike. A uh, question for Quentin. As a filmmaker, you're always more interested in the past, whether it's historical periods uh, or uh, cinematic styles. Um, I just wondered if you ever have a hankering or how you think you'd tackle it if you looked in the other direction, not necessarily making a film set in the future, um, but, you know, uh, adapting your style away from Westerns and the, the cult genres we know you for. That's, you know, actually, that's a really interesting idea. I don't think anyone's ever proposed it exactly the way you proposed it to me. Uh, um, uh, everyone always talks about the science fiction genre in particular, which always makes me think about people in spaceships, and that's never, and I, I, I can appreciate that, but that's not really uh, um, uh, where I think my, my, dramatist a aspect lies. However, the way you posted before, I don't think I've ever thought about it as far as like dealing with a, 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 a future society like ours, but what, 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 would, that in, what would that entail? And what, what would it mean to jump you know, 20 years or 50 years or 100 years in the future and literally look at it from that point of view? I don't, I've never really thought about that before, but that I'm, uh, it's a profound thought, I have to admit. Let, let me ask you a corollary of that. Does uh -oh. making a period film <laughs> allow you the ability to comment on the present in ways that a present day film doesn't? Yeah, well, I think you, there's a definitely a case where if you uh, try to, you, you, when, you try to, when you try to deal, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do, but when you try to deal with uh, um, present themes in the present, uh, you know, you're, that is what you're doing. You know, that is the railroad you're building, and that's where, and that's where that train is going. And you know, that, that can actually be fantastic. We can all point at uh, uh, versions in uh, cinema history that, that has been profound. Um, I do like putting scenario first. I do like putting story first. And I actually like uh, uh, masking whatever I want to say in the guise of genre, so I can say it with my left hand and then deal with the right hand with the genre dictates. Um, however, in that, in this instance, per se, uh, or in particular, I guess is what I meant, is um, it's one of the benefits of the Western genre. I think there's no other genre that has dealt, that deals with America better uh, uh, in, its, uh, in a subtextual way than uh, the Westerns uh, being made in the, in the different uh, decades, i.e., like the 50s Westerns very much uh, uh, put forth uh, an Eisenhower idea of America and an American exceptionalism aspect of it, where the Westerns of the 70s were very cynical about America. And uh, the, one of the, you know, um, it, it was a drag that that first draft of the script got out when it did. <laughs> However, as we were making this movie was during that last year and a half where many of the themes that we were dealing with, we were watching on television when we got home and we would come to the set and we would talk about them. The one good thing about the script getting out there as soon as I'm on record for having written this before all this shit started <laughs> popping off in the last year and a half. Yeah. 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 Uh, next question, let's go The other good bit. thing about that too is I died a lot earlier in that other script. Yeah, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I Again. forgot about that until no, somebody, you I mentioned didn't. it to somebody else. Yeah, I did. Well, go here. <laughs> wait for your microphone. Again, spread the love around. Hi, see if you can ask um, some other people questions. Mario uh, from Mexico. I would like to ask with uh, the Mexican fellow over there. The of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> if you're from Mexico, yeah. yeah. Can you talk? Uh, you, you, you are famous in Mexico to explore to the bones, the characters, and having fun portraying them. Can you talk about how much fun do you have in the set and how much 
you, you were allowed to do it in your character? Um, Viva Mexico, cabrones. <laughs> 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 Yeah, hello Trump. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I just had the best seat in the house. House seats, you know, from day one, meeting this guy right here and uh, being, being, being a big fan of his films forever. It was just great to see how, you know, to see him in action and see, see him how he does what he does. And then uh, I remember having this uh, first uh, table reading with all these beautiful actors reading those lines. That was, for me, you know, a, a beautiful ride. And uh, I still have the best seat in the house, you know. I'm just having a lot of fun. And uh, you need a crazy director, a free director, a director that's not afraid of taking risks in order to help you get, you know, where you want to go. So that's pretty much what we did. Good question. I'm going to go here. Go ahead. Yep. Wait for the mic. Uh, this is for Michael and Tim. You guys have been with Quentin from the very beginning. So what's a then and now situation for, for Mr. Tarantino? Michael's ready. Well, at least we didn't get stuck together this time. <laughs> um, Tim and I embraced each other on the set of Reservoir Dogs. And we had both so much blood on our bodies that we were stuck together. <laughs> And uh, we were stuck together like more than we wanted to be. It was like the hug that lasted a little too long. <laughs> and, and they actually had to use a, 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 a garden hose to, uh, to separate us. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we, it was good in our deaths this time that we, we were on opposite sides of the room. But <laughs> I, I, I enjoyed so much watching Tim and watching him find his character. Um, I think back in the dog days, you know, I was a young man and I was very naive. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Not that I do now, but uh, I, I enjoyed watching Tim and I enjoyed watching him much more than I would have remembered from the years before. That's what changed for me is I grew to appreciate and watch him, how wonderful he is, you know, as a friend also. Tim? <laughs> Come on, buddy. <laughs> He's, all right. <laughs> no He's all right. He's all right. No, it's, it's been a trip. It's been a trip. Um, it was kind of a weird sensation to be the old school, the old the old boys coming in, because Sam's been around around as much as I have around Quentin. But but so I've been I have a, had a long um, break, and I, I didn't make it make it back in since uh, sort of forums and pop, pop fiction. So. For us, it was kind of a... Four you rooms, four rooms. Four rooms, sorry. Um, but um, so I didn't know the new new kind of version of what, of how he filmed and, uh, and, the, and the, the kind of atmosphere that on set that he, he's encouraged and developed. It was brand new for me. So it was almost, in a sense, like coming to Quentin fresh again. It was, it was a, wonderful. Quentin, are you writing for specific actors for most of the roles, some of the roles? Yeah, in this case, uh, yeah, uh, everybody here... <coughs> that I'd worked with before, uh, I wrote for them okay. in, in, in that case. The, 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 uh, the wild cards were uh, 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 Dom Ragu and uh, Bob and Jody. Uh, next question, let's go here. Go ahead, yep, wait for the mic. My question is for Walton. Uh, yeah. What's the over under on whether your character in Hateful Eight is related to your character in Django? <laughs> I'll say it again. I'm what's sorry. the over and under <laughs> on whether what's the over and under on whether or not your character in Django is related to your character in Hateful Eight? Uh, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's yeah. That the, uh, that's his uncle or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. What a shitty family. What a <laughs> <laughs> shitty group of people. God. <laughs> I wouldn't want to have them the over worst family in ever. America. <laughs> America, the no, Borgias you know, of America. You know, uh, uh, you said something. You said something earlier uh, that was so uh, interesting to me. You, you, you talk about Quentin, and, and people talk about Quentin's dialogue, and, and from but from an actor's perspective, but you have to understand this is this is like finding like gold in a river. This is like panning for gold, like in in the gold rush days in California, when you come across this, when you get this invitation. And there was one day in particular, this is a great story. 
There was one day in particular where uh, I, I read this stuff like 300 times. We all do. And Quentin said at the outset, he said, you need to know these words, as every actor up here does. Not just so that you can be ready at any given moment to kind of go wherever it is in the story, but so that you can give this man a hundred different versions if that's what he needs in order to reach his, his vision, right? And, and that's just kind of what I do. That's how I, how, how I look at it. And there was one day in particular where Quentin gave me a, a, a monologue, like a, and it was just a, like a page. And I've spent 14 years in television, learning 10 pages from me like in an hour is no problem. But this is Quentin Tarantino dialogue. And, and it started off in the morning. I got it first thing as soon as I got there, right after our coffee. <laughs> like, like our, we have a coffee club in the morning. And so, and so I'm sitting there, man. I'm having the best fucking day. I know 150 pages of this script. I know everybody's shit. And then I get this, this thing. It's like, like from Coco, who just kind of comes up and says, oh, hey, uh, Quentin wants you to say this later on today. And it's like, like, like here, right? It's the whole thing. And it just like freaked me out and like it brought me down. It was like, because it's like, oh fuck, really? Now I gotta get up from the coffee and I start walking around and, and people see that I'm, I'm freaking out a little bit. And Tim, Tim says, uh, uh, hey man, what's wrong, what's wrong with you? I said, look, I got this right here. I got this today. I got this today. He said, you got that, man. No, I don't. I don't fucking have this. <laughs> and, then, and then Kurt, like literally an hour later, and I'm, and I'm just pacing around back and forth, and Kurt said, hey, man, what's, what's wrong with you? I said, this, man, this. <laughs> and he said, you, you got this. I said, no, I fucking don't. <laughs> and then the same with Sam. Sam said something, too, because I just walk and I pace. And then that night, it all came down to, uh, uh, it was the last thing that we shot, and it was with me and Bruce, mm -hmm. and we're sitting there in the chair, and even then, I'm just fucking freaking out, and Quentin just looks at me, and he says, you got this, mate. <laughs> <laughs> you want a red one with rolling out? This is for Quentin. Um, in a sense, right here. <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> in a sense, you created your own genre. Your movies are powerful and thought-provoking, and often dancing on the edge of being politically correct. What are your thoughts on being politically correct in today's society? Um, I don't have much thought on that other, uh, um, other than just kind of, I guess, in a, uh, in a conversation like the way you're having it right now, the way you're asking for uh, uh, it uh, to me right now. Or, um, I guess I, I, just, I just don't think about it that way. I mean, um, uh, it isn't, it, one can be inclined to just say, oh, F this political correctness, I don't have time for that. But uh, also, the, you know, but in, in polite society, there is such a thing as, uh, as sensitivity to some issues as time has gone on. And there was a time that we weren't politically correct at all. And we all wince at uh, uh, moments when we look past and, and, and we see that. I, I don't really know what the answer is as far as, that, as far as that is concerned. However, me as an artist, I don't really think about it at all. It actually is not my job to think about that. Um, and especially in terms of with me as a writer, in particularly as, I mean, also as a filmmaker, but I'm not worried about the filmmaking part because if I've written it, that's what I'm gonna do. Uh, but in particularly as a writer, it is my job to, to ignore social critics or the response that social critics might have when it comes to um, uh, uh, the opinions of my characters, the way they talk, or anything that can happen to them. I mean, we can talk about exactly, uh, you know, we can talk about the race stuff, which we actually talk, but I'm sure somebody, some people here sitting in the room uh, might be uncomfortable about the violence that is handed out to Jennifer's character. And actually, I'm playing with that in the course of the movie. When she gets that cracked in the head by John Ruth at the beginning of the movie, that is meant to send a shockwave mm -hmm. out through the audience. Uh, and, it, uh, and you're meant to think. You're not necessarily meant to like Domergu in that moment, uh, but you are meant to think that John Ruth is a brutal bastard at that moment, because that does seem like a, a rather overreaction. To what, she, uh, to what she did and what she said. Now time goes on and you see how you feel about the characters. But uh, it's meant to do that. Um, but there is this aspect of uh, the way this story works in general is I have trapped eight people, actually nine people if you include OB. I, he's not part of the Hateful Eight because he's not hateful. 
<laughs> all right, uh, be the Hateful Eight and OB, all right, would be the... Uh, 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 Gabby Hayes. Yeah. Uh, but the thing is, though, uh, uh, but the way the story works, part of the actual, that tension that we're talking about, the pressure cooker that we're talking about, and because of you know where I'm coming from, you know, in that vaguely-esque, Peckinpah-esque way, to some degree or another, uh, is anything can happen to these guys. Anything can happen to these characters. Any piece of outrageous violence could happen to them. And there is, and I, I, I paint in a, in a system where there aren't color book lines. I can cross those lines. You know, the way, the way graphic novels, I don't mean graphic novels as in a comic book, but the way novels that deal with violence kind of almost seem to go anywhere in a way that movies aren't allowed to go. And uh, so in that scenario, what, I'm going to make it that, oh, seven of these characters, anything can happen to them. But when it comes to this eighth character, I have to protect her because she's a woman and they can't have the destiny that it can happen to any of these other characters. No, that goes against the entire story. I'm not going to think like that. And when I think of, uh, um, I guess, a bit basically uh, an artistic hero in that you know, predecessor when it comes to that, I, I think of somebody like Ken Russell, who was, uh, uh, you know, who was raked over the coals by the press in England constantly for the, the boundaries he pushed. And he said, you know, do, do, they, do they let these people get you down? And he goes, I don't think about them. I can't think about them. It's my job not to think about them because I believe in what I'm doing 100%. And I am doing what I'm doing. And if you don't like it, don't go see it. Well, way to end. Thank you guys for your patience. Thank you guys for sharing your time. <laughs>